Hello, everybody. Good morning and Happy New Year to everybody. And I want to start out first by thanking Jim for the opportunity to uh, set me up with a presentation here. I, I do enjoy doing that. I used to be scared to death to talk to people, but since I can hide behind my pictures, it works out great. Um, I was lucky enough to marry my wife, Sandy, here about, uh, what was it, 16 years ago. And that first year, she said, you know, you take nice pictures. We, she lived in Laguna Beach, so I always say, well, I had to get married to move into Laguna Beach, California, because pretty nice community. And she was lucky enough to buy in there when, when uh, she could afford it. And so I got to move in there when we got married and just love it. But the first year, she threw out a challenge. She said, you know, you take nice pictures. Why don't you see if you can show them in these art shows? Because there's the Sawdust Festival, the Art Affair, and the Festival of Arts right there in Laguna Beach that goes all summer long. So I thought, well, OK, just to keep her happy, I'll try. And I didn't have any pictures printed or anything. So I got three pictures printed. And I got juried into one of the shows that later I found was really hard to get into. So I was happy about that. and. I, uh, but I guess going back a ways, I had been born and grew up in Tanzania, went to high school in Kenya, like Jim said, and um, I just love Africa. And the people are so friendly, so kind, they'll help you with whatever you need or do whatever they can for you, and always with a smile. Just an amazing place for great people. And so I like going back to Africa, and I'd been back a few times, and when I started showing my pictures in the art shows, a lady walked up to me one day and she said, I can tell by your pictures that you should be leading photo safaris in Africa, and I know who to set you up with. And that was completely different than, I want to go on safari, who should I go with? So that's what I usually heard. So when she said that, I thought, well, I'll meet this man. And, and he was an Indian. He was a, a, a Indian from, his parents were from India, but he was born and grew up in Kenya. And then, he uh, was at the restaurant when I walked in, and I heard him talking to who I thought was the waiter. I later found out it was the owner. It was a younger man. And he said, I wish you'd let me put a little tent on your tables and let me have my advertise my safaris. And the guy said, well, what would I get out of it? And he said, I would pay you when somebody signed up for a safari. And he said, well, how would I know if somebody signed up for a safari? And Prem said, you just have to trust my honor. And I thought, that's an unusual comment. So uh, I'll get to know this man and see. Because I was leery of leading safaris because I thought, if I take people from the States, they'll complain about the dust and the dirt and the poverty. And it would be, just be a problem for me. So I thought, I'm not going to do it. I'll just pay and go myself once in a while. And so then I got invited to do a workshop up in Yosemite. And the roads were just as rough and dusty and washboard. And I noticed. All the photographers, all they talked about was the pictures they got. So I thought, well, I'll try a safari, and I'll do it as a photo safari. And that was my first, that was the first one that I led in 2005. And I just finished in September my 72nd. So it's been a good run for me. And I hope it keeps going for at least another seven years is what I plan to do these trips, because I, I lead the tours. I take up to 17 or 18 people with me to Tanzania and Kenya, but we travel with only three passengers for vehicle because they're trips that are designed for photographers. And if you're not a photographer, you just have a lot more room than most of the other people. So it works out great. In Southern Africa, we have to have six people per vehicle, but the vehicles are open, so you still have plenty of room, plenty of space to photograph. And it works out very well. Um, the equipment I use is simple. I use a Canon 7D, well, I have two camera bodies, 7D Mark IIs, and then I have a 70 to 200 millimeter lens, 2.8, and a 200 to 400 with a teleconverter built into it. If you flip the lever, it goes up to 560 millimeters. And then I also take a 18 to 135 in case anything is real close. I want to shoot it with that. But most of the time, I use the longer telephoto. And so just a great lens. It's got a great image stabilizer in it because you'll see a few pictures as I go through them that I shot them like at a 40th of a second hand holding it or just resting the lens on the seat in front of me, something like that. So it's an amazing lens. And uh, it did help me a lot once I got that. So that was nice to, uh, 
be able to acquire a good piece of equipment. I rarely use a tripod because they don't fit in the vehicles. And around the lodges, I found that I'm steady enough when I handhold it. If I put my ISO up a little bit, I get a fast enough shutter speed. I shoot an aperture priority probably 98% of the time. It's just something I'm used to. If I'm not changing settings all the time, I don't forget the setting, and I find that it works well for me. So I try to keep it simple and uh, just love doing these trips. I do five trips a year, five tours a year now. And uh, I was doing eight, but I thought that was too many. At my age, I don't need to be doing that many. So I was getting too tired. So anyway, let me get started here and um, we'll show you, I, start, I will start off with some of my dad's pictures. There, it's back on again. Thank you. Okay, let's see here. I'm the one in the little red outfit. Where I grew up, oh, thank you. Where I grew up, if somebody wanted some meat to eat or you wanted some vegetables or whatever, you either had to go out and shoot the animal or you had to grow your vegetables. So it was really kind of a, a place where you had, to, you, you had to sustain yourself. And we got used to that, we loved it, and it was just a great, great uh, experience for me to grow up that way. This was my first experience with digital photography because my dad had taken this slide, and I think it was, I, I don't remember now, if it was ectochrome or kodachrome film, but that's what he used, either one of those, almost completely faded out. and. A friend of mine named Ken Rockwell came over and he showed me how to scan a slide. And then he said, okay, now hit that saturation button and just slide it and see what happens. That's all it took to bring that picture back. And that's what I got. You could almost see right through the slide and not see anything before that. It was amazing. Tom Hanks has nothing on me. <laughs> so when I was a kid, we used to, my dad would take us camping at the, at the beach in Dar es Salaam. Every year for two weeks, we camped right on the beach, set up our tents and whatever. It was fantastic. And one day I found this little raft that floated up in the, in the waves. And uh, so I said, well, I'm going to get in it. I'm going to go out there. And all of a sudden, I'm out there. And I thought, how do I get back? I don't know. So fortunately, my brother was a good swimmer. And he swam out and pulled me back in. So that's how we got back. But here I wanted to show you where I do most of my trips. I do. Kenya, Tanzania, and most of the safaris are right in this area because that's where most of the animals are. And then I do Zambia down here, South Luangwa, um, Botswana, and I do Rwanda for the mountain gorillas, and uh, South Africa, Namibia. I did for four years. I led tours in Namibia, but I've, I've taken that off my list for now because of too many tours. Um, but I could be encouraged to do it again. So... It's just, they're all great places. I love going there. And uh, so let's go on safari. We meet our natural, or our uh, native guides. And <laughs> what, what this is actually, on our way to the Ngorongoro Crater, you have to watch your car. You roll up all your windows because these guys will get in and steal all the fruit or the candy that's in the car. So you just have to be careful. But uh, this was somebody else's car. <laughs> Here's ours. We travel in vehicles like this. Three passengers in a big nine-passenger vehicle. And what's wonderful about Africa nowadays is the animals are used to the vehicles. They come right up close. And they're not challenging the vehicles because they don't eat vehicles. And as long as you stay inside the frame of the vehicle, they think you're part of the car and you don't have to worry. So, but lighting is so important, and um, that's part of what I really watch for when I'm photographing. I heard one night there was a leopard up in a tree. I said, how far away? And he said, well, it's pretty far. And I said, well, like how far? And he goes, about a half a mile. I said, let's go. We still have time before the sun completely sets. So we ran over there and I got about two pictures and then it came down out of the tree. So I was just lucky to get that, but I love that. It was in Lake Nakuru in Tanzania. Everybody likes lions. How about a two day old lion? This was the youngest one I've ever seen in the Serengeti a year and a half ago. It was just amazing because the mothers didn't care that we came. We, they were right by the road in the grass, and we just drove up. And these little guys 
crawled out of the grass to try to nurse on their mom. And it was fascinating because this one finally found a nipple to latch onto and mom turned over. <laughs> I thought, how rude is that? <laughs> so anyway, but the lions, the big male lions, I love photographing them and I always love getting one walking at me. And when you think you've got a nice sunny day, the sun's, sun's just coming up and it's nice and bright and beautiful, the lions won't open their eyes and look at it because it's bright. So they keep their eyes closed. But here I fortunately got one when he opened his eyes. And this elephant is massive. He's the biggest elephant I've ever seen. Photographed him in Amboseli. They call him Tim for whatever reason. But last month I get a, I get a magazine online called Africa Geographic and last month Tim had to be rescued because he got into the mud so deep that he couldn't get out and he was just stuck down, mired in the mud. And so the crews got together, um, even the elephant rescue, uh, Sheldrick Elephant uh, Orphanage sent out a rescue team, and they all got cables together, a 300 yard cable, somehow that they got around the head of the elephant, pulled him to a safer place where he could at least stand up on the mud and then get out of there. But it took him a good share of the day to do it. But just rescued him. And just amazing that I saw that. And uh, I photographed him here about two years ago. This is Tim showing you how big he is compared to, say, a female elephant. The one on the left is the female elephant. Look at how big he is, just huge. It was almost as though the other elephants revered him as he walked by. And rhinos. I just love rhinos. But they're hard to photograph these days because they're hard to find. And so it's really sad what the poachers have done to the uh, numbers that they have of rhinos. But um, this one was at Lake Nakuru. He was out running along the shore and he saw us and all of a sudden he turned to charge our vehicle. He didn't come all the way, he just stopped. But it's interesting the way he's kicking up the dust. I always like to get something special in the picture that is different than normal, than just an animal looking at you if they're running, jumping. Uh, whatever. I love that kind of photography. And here, buffalo are not the most exciting animals to photograph, I'll tell you. And, but here when he's got the bright early morning sunlight or the soft early morning light and the ox peckers on him like that, I just thought that made a better picture of a, of a buffalo. And cheetahs are always fun to try to photograph. You want to photograph them early in the morning or late in the evening because that, the sunlight will get into their eyes then and you can uh, see that amber color of their eyes. It's just beautiful. Fortunately, here she had her little cubs with her that morning. In the giraffe, I've waited a long time to get a picture like that because the giraffe usually were too far away or whatever reason, I just didn't see that. So finally, a couple years ago, I was able to get that. Just love it. And here early in the morning, uh, we were watching these lions and somebody in a different vehicle dropped their lens cap. And this, it rattled in the car. So this little cub looked up to see what is that. And just, I like the way the eyes were there. I like the tail over the top of it, over mom. And just, I just love the picture. It's first light on the Chobe River. And I, and I kind of like pictures that tell a story. To me, this big scar across his nose tells me this guy's a real fighter, but he's also a survivor. And uh, leopards are territorial, so he's probably just fighting for his territory or trying to take over somebody else's territory. But uh, always interesting to see these guys. And one day we were in this trip. My wife was with me on this trip. We were in a lodge in Madikwe in northern South Africa. We look out off the balcony. Here's these elephants drinking water down there. I just thought that was beautiful, the way the mother was watching over the little one. And then it's always nice to get uh, mothers taking care of their young. Baboons. This was in uh, Tanzania. <laughs> it looks like it was photoshopped, <laughs> but it wasn't. Once in a lifetime, you get a chance to get a picture like this. I was in uh, a park called Sweetwaters. In, uh, it's a private reserve, and they have these reticulated giraffe there, and we were ready to leave on our three o'clock game drive. We go from three o'clock till seven o'clock at night. And so I said, you guys, there's a herd of giraffe coming. They're only about a half a mile away. They should be here in about five minutes. 
let's see what happens. And sure enough, they came to the water. We got pictures of three of them down drinking in a row, a couple standing like they're at a prom or something. But this is the picture I love because it's so different. Um, people say, well, they protect that young one while he's down. Well, it's not a young one. It's the same size as those guys. He's just got his head bent down. And the two in the back are young males that were fighting with each other. So it kind of takes away the mystery when you hear all of that. They just happen to line up behind that one, and I like that, so I got the picture. What was nice was everybody in my group got the picture, too. And reflections. I love reflections, especially of zebras and uh, some other animals in the water. Animals in the, near the water, I just love it. Reflections are great. And here one evening, I, a leopard was, we were following this leopard because we thought he was trying to hunt. So he's on the move, and we got way ahead of him as he came out of the bushes. I saw he was going to walk into this shaft of sunlight, and I, the bushes were in the shade, in the deep shade behind him. So I took the picture, and it worked out really well. I did darken a little bit around him so that to kind of cut out most of the bushes, but I wanted to see some of the bushes. So there's not much done to it, but it was just a beautiful opportunity. And the leopard cubs, everybody loves them. This was the first time I'd seen them. They, we, we were looking for them early in the morning in Botswana, and we had seen that they were living in this cave the day before. So we drove by in the morning, and they, they heard our car, and they came out to see who we were. And they played for 45 minutes out there. It was just magnificent. And I just like, this one's just kind of a different um, uh, take on an elephant. You don't usually see that perspective, but we just took this in September um, on the Chobe River. And then some kingfishers feeding each other. Mom feeding the baby a fish. Took that into Masai Mara. Uh, I think it was in July this year, last year. Marshall eagle. They're big birds. I always try to get the catch light, what I call is the catch light, is the sunlight glinting on the eye. And then he had a stormy sky behind him, so I thought that enhanced the picture a little bit. And um, these guys are big enough that they'll actually catch small gazelle and take them down. They're amazing. They're good hunters. And when they fly over, all the other birds fly away or give out warnings. Like uh, a lot of the animals will send out warning calls to let other animals know that there's a predator in the area. I like contrast, and this was in Namibia. I love that. That elephant down in the water was interesting because the herds would come and rotate, and about every 20 minutes, a new herd would come in, and then they'd leave, but this guy wouldn't leave. He was having too much fun and just stayed in the water through about three different herds and just loved it, so it was fun to photograph that, but I like the dust on the elephants in the background. Light and dust, it really makes, uh, makes for great pictures, I think. And again, the silhouettes, or not silhouettes, uh, reflections. If you can get a nice, calm thing, something nice in front of it, it makes for nice reflections. I guess I would have liked them to be a little bit closer to the water, but you can't just pick up lions and move them. I haven't learned to do that yet. Now, this one is interesting because you see this out of focus on the left-hand corner down there. Um, that is, I lost my cursor here. There it is. That is the knee of the tracker. The guy who sits out on the front of the car and watches for tracks to tell you where the animals are. Well, we came on these lions and they were eating a zebra. And this lion had just finished eating and he went over and he laid down about 20 feet away. And all of a sudden his eye caught this uh, tracker sitting up there. And he got curious. And you see it get up and start walking slowly. He wasn't sure what that was. So he was going very carefully slowly and slowly, slowly towards the tracker until he got about three feet away. And I took that picture then, and I thought, man, I wonder what the tracker's going to do. And so all of a sudden, you saw the tracker's hand just go down by between the radiator and the roll bar in front of the radiator, and he had a machete tucked in there. And he just rattled the handle, and the lion took off running. So it was interesting to see. They're afraid of stuff that they're not used to. But uh, they're used to people running, so don't think... <laughs> 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 Don't think you're going to get away. <laughs> but again, light and dust. Here we go. Elephants throwing dust on themselves and the sunlight in the background. I just love that. To me, it's kind of an artistic picture. So I like that. Or a rhino in the mud. Rhinos are interesting because they like the mud, 
but they don't necessarily like the water. You don't see them out in the water very often, but they'll roll in the mud, and the mud helps to get the, uh, give them sunscreen and gets rid of some of the ticks and things like that that get on their bodies. A greater kudu, just a beautiful antelope, large horns like that, and I finally got one out in the open. The males almost always hide in the bushes, but finally we had one here out in the open, and it was just beautiful. This is a garnuck, the giraffe gazelle, they call them. And uh, they stand on their back or their hind legs and they up against these acacia trees with all the thorns. They eat the little green leaves between the thorns, somehow without getting the thorns up their nose. And they never need to drink water. They get enough moisture out of those little green leaves that they, they don't have to drink water. Uh, I think I've seen one drinking water once, but not very seldom. And it's in the desert area, so... They survive on that. But action is one of my favorite things to photograph. In this one, I, pho I, I saw the lioness laying in these bushes back to the, just to the right of where she is right now. It was back right in this area. And I saw her watching as four zebras came walking up. And three zebras walked right on by, and she didn't do anything. And then this one was the last one. And all of a sudden, she just exploded out of those bushes. And I had focused, fortunately, I would focused on her eyes, so I just kept that focus point on her eyes. That's why the zebra's not in the picture on the left. But in the next picture, I thought, oh, man, she's got that zebra. And I kind of felt bad for the zebra. But I didn't know how fast the zebras could take off. And she just gunned it and left that lioness just standing there. So it was cool. That was in Botswana. And this guy's on his way to the prom. Just, he's all dressed up. It's a Cory Bustard. And they uh, look completely different when he's just normally walking around. You don't see all the white feathers on his neck. His tail's down. You just see brown everywhere. Kind of boring looking. But when they get uh, trying to attract the females, they just look beautiful. And then zebras are often fighting with each other. The males are always sparring, it seems like. And so I try to photograph that. And it's hard because they're usually on the run away from you or uh, just a long distance away. But once in a while, you get one close enough that you can get a nice picture. The lions are affectionate, just really almost seems like loving animals. And I like photographing the human uh, characteristics of these animals, what I call human qualities. Um, just fun to see if you see a lion and a lioness and they've been separated or even lionesses, and they've been separated. When they get together, they will nuzzle each other, and it's a great time for photographs, so just get ready. Or sometimes you, we've seen lions mating on almost every trip, and it's always an experience to try to get them facing the right direction or turning with the light, whatever. But I just love this guy's face, the way he looks so vicious, and his big mane, he's just, just a beautiful lion. That was in the Ngorongoro crater in Tanzania. And the birds are beautiful in Africa. You have a lot of beautiful birds. This is a pale chanting goshawk. And we waited about five minutes for it to finally take off. And I was lucky when he did. The sunlight was right in the eye. And he's got his wings out. So I just love that picture. They're, they're such beautiful birds. This is a colobus monkey. One day we were driving up to a lodge. And I saw these monkeys coming down out of the tree. And I couldn't believe it, because the colobus monkeys almost always are seen 100 feet or higher in the tree. Well, they had a, a stone that had a hollow spot in it. They had put water in it. And these monkeys were coming down to drink. And this female came down. She looked at me. She looked at the water, looked at me, looked at the water, back and forth quite some time. And all of a sudden, another monkey came down out of the tree, took that baby, and went up the tree. Mother went over to get a drink, came back. The other one brought the baby back down to her. And it was just amazing. I didn't see any, uh, you know, talking between the two of them or anything like that. It was like they just knew what to do and did it. <laughs> now, <laughs> this was a cool thing. I call this got soap. And what's interesting is I sell my pictures at art shows. And... This year, this picture in one form or another was probably half of my sales. And when I first, put the, when I first printed the picture, I thought, wow, that's really cool. I'm going to put it up because it'll get people in my booth, but who's going to buy that? And a lot of people have bought it. And so that shows you what I know about sales. <laughs> 
And here they were. What they were, they were eating some little antelope down there in the mud. And the cubs had walked across the top of the mud. It was a dried mud flat. The cubs walked across the top. They found it and started eating it. And he said, they're not eating that without me. And he just went charging out there and dug up all the mud, tore up all the mud. And then he was growling and snarling at the little cubs. And they just kept eating and eating and eating, didn't even pay any attention. Finally, he took, this is his paw, the male's paw, across the top of this uh, right here. And he stuffed the one cub under the mud. <laughs> and he held him down for like 10 seconds. And I thought, when that guy comes up, he's going to be coughing and sputtering. On the contrary, he just went straight to the meat like it was a magnet and started eating again. And it was just amazing. So it was something that I, I've only seen at one time, probably may never see it again because it was so unusual. And uh, just the little cubs got so tired out there in that mud trying to hold themselves up. But the one guy got away with the spoils. You know, He got a leg. It was just a little tiny animal. And I thought, why was it all those lions were out there after that animal? Because they didn't look like they were really hungry. But that's what they all looked like when they were out there in the mud. The big male almost got stuck to the point where he couldn't get out. And that's what had happened to that antelope that was in there, too. So I thought, wow, because it was deep enough that he had to think about where he was going to put each foot as he came out. So it was uh, interesting to watch. I videotaped it, and it was, it was pretty fascinating. But again, reflections are beautiful. The zebras in Namibia. And uh, rhino, I like, I just took this picture of a rhino on my last trip, and I just like that they're looking straight at me like that because they're wondering, what is that in that car? They can't see very well. They can only see about 15 or 20 feet, but they hear really well. They listen to what we're saying. And so he had his ears towards us, and it just made, made an ideal photograph of a rhino. For those monsters, are they marking that particular animal? Is that yes. Idea? On the ears, yes. They, they, the game... Game scouts or game wardens mark the animals. They know how many rhinos are in the park that way. If we don't get to somebody with a mic, could you repeat the question when uh, somebody asks you? Oh, thank you. Thanks for reminding me. Yes, he had asked um, if those notches were on the rhino's ears so that they could keep track of the rhinos. And that's what they are. Their game rangers put those on there so they can keep track of them. Now, sometimes I'll see something that I just love, that little baby there ahead of the mom. I just love it, but I really did not like this shadow here around the mom's ear. So I thought, well, maybe in a few, few steps, she'll come out, she'll put her ear back or something like that. So she did. The baby's still doing something cool, and that's a picture I'm able to use. <laughs> These are not trained. <laughs> Well, the deal was we were watching this, we were, well, we were watching the mother with these little cubs. She had five cubs, and all of a sudden she jumped up on top of a car, and the cubs were trying to get up to her, and that was as high as they could get. But I just loved that. They were so cute. But then last year, 2017, we, I had my best friends with me. We lived in San Diego. I lived in San Diego for 35 years, and my neighbors were Alex and Joni, the two dark-haired uh, clients in there. And... I couldn't believe it. On about the third day of the safari, I got a cheetah up on their car, and then I had ours drive around, so they were in the light, and I was able to photograph. Whoops. And it was just amazing how that cheetah was just posing. It just would sit there for a while, get up, look around. It's only up there usually about two minutes, and then they move on. What they do is they jump up there so they can see where the gazelle are, and then they move on. But they were just having a great time. The only problem with that is if you're in the car, you can't see the cheetah. So, Paul, didn't you have a cheetah jump into a, somebody's lap in the front seat once? Well, they didn't get his lap. <laughs> but, but they did jump in. They had, the cheetah had his, the window was open. He was shooting off of the beanbag. And he, a cheetah was right there, had his paws up on, the, up on the beanbag. And all of a sudden, it just leaped right inside the window, put its hands up on, or its, its hands, its feet on the dashboard. And it stopped there, and it kind of looked around and went, well, guess there's nothing in here I can eat. And it just turned and jumped out. And I've got pictures of the whole thing, but I usually don't. I don't like to show them because the, you're, the drivers are not supposed to let the cheetahs get that close. <laughs> so, but it was an amazing experience. So, and here, I don't know if you see the little dragonfly sitting on that uh, crocodile. I guess it's a brave dragonfly. I'm not sure. But I just like that. 
And then the cape hunting dogs or African wild dogs, or now they're calling them painted dogs, whatever. They're just beautiful animals, and they can hunt. They hunt in packs, and they're just amazing. They're just amazing. And I like to hear these guys just running along, having a good time, and the one just jumping up in the air. I just thought that was entertaining. And some days a mud bath is good, you know. Um, the buffalo like to get down in the mud. Again, it's sunscreen, bug repellent. So they spend quite a bit of time. If they find a mud hole, they'll spend time in the mud hole. And I always love the affection between the lions. Here, the mother and the cub. Uh, this one, I did do a lot of adjustment in Photoshop because it was a bright day. The lion was dark. The background was almost white. So I just lightened the shadows, darkened the highlights. And that was pretty much, that's how I got this picture, to be something I could use. Now, sometimes you don't have good light. This was back in 2003. I was on a trip, and that morning we, we were watching this big elephant. He's about the second biggest elephant I've ever seen, and he was just to the left of the car grazing. We watched him for probably half an hour, 45 minutes, and it was a drizzly day, dark, cloudy. All of a sudden, he stood up like that, and I couldn't believe it because I'd never even seen a picture of that. And my guide said, the guides who just never get excited, he's going, take the picture, take the picture, take the picture. <laughs> so I took pictures. And afterwards, my guide said, that's the first time I've seen that in 35 years of taking people on safari. And he goes, you were here. And he had been rolling in black mud or, or blowing black dust on himself. And here I went back three years later, looked like he'd been through a truck wash. And he's got these notches on his forehead or below his eyes. You can see their X's, I'm sorry. Um, that tells me it's the same animal because they're just wrinkles that are there, X's, double X's and diagonal lines on each side. And he's just a, just a well-known elephant out there in Tanzania. And I had one of these for a pet when I was little. It's a vervet monkey, V-E-R-V-E-T. And they're just fabulous little guys, so curious, so playful, always fun. And I like the way he was, this is his mother on the left, um, and he's just peeking out around the leaf at me. Lilac breasted roller. They're one of the more prettier birds, and the people just seem like everybody wants to photograph them. A baboon, and it's carrying its baby down underneath like that. Baboons are hard to photograph because you have to get them early morning or late afternoon because otherwise the sun is too high and their eyes look like dark black holes. And sometimes you get one just doing something interesting. Here. I like, I like a giraffe doing something with its tongue rather than just sitting there, standing there looking at you. So here he's got his tongue out like that. I think that's a little bit more interesting. Now this is a weaver bird, and they're interesting because the males build the nest, the female comes along and inspects it, and if she doesn't like it, he's got to either build a new nest or get a different girlfriend. So it's just fascinating, but you'll see them working really hard on the nest. They do a great job. And just the affection here. The elephants, I love the elephants and their behavior. They're just so affectionate and so caring towards each other. And the zebras, I like the action again. These two were running around chasing each other, male after male. And then a bee eater, a little bee eater with a, looks like it's got a cricket or something in its beak. Even the gazelle, the antelope are just beautiful. If you just stop and you look at one, um, I was lucky on this trip, he was standing up on a knoll right above the car, just right next to the road, and she was just, it's a female, she was just beautiful, I thought. And uh, I thought, I don't need a pair of horns on that one, because usually I like animals with horns on them. I don't know, I just think that adds something to them. This was last February, and it looked like it was in the studio. They're little bat-eared foxes, and uh, even the flowers in the background, I just thought, I can't believe that, because you get about... 10 seconds to photograph these guys, because as soon as they see you, they jump down their burrows and they're gone. So um, this day, I had about 10 seconds, got a few pictures, and that was my favorite. And this was something we just saw in September. Um, it's a striped hyena. And I'd never seen one before that was just out in the open long enough for me to get a nice picture. And I just thought, wow, what? 
an interesting looking animal uh, with those big jaws. You can see how their jaws are really strong. Some lions had been chasing this one, so he was being very wary. Uh, eye contact with that little glint in the eye. Just, I just love her eyes. And a gray crowned crane. This one was walking along. It, this one actually was in a uh, nurse, uh, what do you call the uh, animal orphanage? The bird is wild, but it was in an animal orphanage because they could scavenge food in there. And it's walking along, and I saw it was drizzling, and there was a dark, dark trunk on a tree. And I thought if I underexpose the picture a little bit, I hope the white comes out right. And it just came out right as it walked in front of that tree. I got the dark background. And sometimes this one I did the, and more with the shadows and highlights because it was after the sun had gotten up. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they were just fighting and fighting and fighting. But they weren't actually biting each other. They were standing there just like that, making all these loud noises over this pond that the one on the left is in. And then I realized the one on the right, his tooth is broken off on the, on the bottom. His tusk is broken off, so probably he wasn't going to be really fighting that guy. There were just a lot of noise going on. It's always interesting, though. And so this guy had some humor there, I think. Check out these teeth. Then one evening after the sun had set, we were just, this was just uh, this last year, we were watching and uh, coming back from the Maasai Boma, and all of a sudden we saw these two cheetahs, and I saw this one gazelle on the other side of a herd of zebra. And the zebra thought that the cheetah was coming after them, I guess, because they all took off. And he went just tearing after the gazelle, but didn't get the gazelle. So he went hungry that night. And elephants. I love close-ups of elephants. Um, they just have so much character, I think. You look at all the wrinkles and the things. I always wonder. They're usually pretty old, and you think, I wonder what all they've seen out here in all the years they've spent. But sometimes, just taking close-ups of them, like, look at that thorn almost going through his trunk. And I think, wow. That can't feel good. Uh, but they just tear these branches off and eat them. Look at that, wrapping his trunk around all the thorns. I see his broken tusk down here. I just find that, uh, that's, you can find so many interesting things in the details. And this guy was finding me interesting. So he was just right at my lodge and I poked my head out the, out the door and there he was, so I started taking pictures. I thought he was just really cute. This impala, it's kind of interesting, it's not actually jumping over the log. He's on the other side of the log, jumping along the side of the log, but trying to clear the river because he knew there's crocodiles coming up the river. Uh, they were just 20 yards away, coming up the river, so he was in a hurry. But uh, one of my favorite trips is to go see the mountain gorillas. You walk right in with them. You hike up the mountain to where they are, and then you just walk right in with the gorillas. This guy was about 10 feet away. And he just stood there looking at me, didn't bother me, and uh, hopefully I didn't bother him. And the little guys. <laughs> I just love the baby gorillas. This little one climbed up over its dad. That was a silverback, and he climbed all the way up, just took a fistful of hair in each hand as he went, climbed all the way up like he was going up a ladder, up over the top. And then <laughs> they're so cute when you watch them. And this was, that's me on the right, my wife on the left. And I had been watching a female with a little tiny baby. And these two gorillas were laying right there. I was about 10 or 15 feet on this side of them. And all of a sudden, my wife was behind me. And all of a sudden, she goes, Paul, don't move right now. And I said, why? And she goes, the one that's bald, he's reached over, and he's got his finger through the loop in your shoelace. And I looked down, and he's just sitting there like this, waiting for me to walk. And I thought to myself, tell me they don't have a sense of humor. And, and then I thought, how am I going to get out of this? And then the guard or the guide said, <coughs> and the girl just pulled his hand back like, okay, I'm sorry. I wasn't supposed to do that. And so it was just fascinating. So, but then this big one started eating a bush, and, and he was facing the wrong way. And I asked uh, uh, our guide if he could get over there and turn that gorilla around somehow. And he goes, well, let me try. And so... He went around the other side of the bush, and he's making all these noises, and all of a sudden, the big silverback goes, ah, ah, ah. and so <laughs> the guide knew he was not supposed to be doing that. So then the guide came back around by me, and he stopped on the left, and 
then the silverback came walking around. He walked right by me, just like brushed my pants as he walked by. And then he got to the guide, and all of a sudden he just went boom. And he pushed the guy down on his back, and he went down, and then he put his leg up on his thigh like this. And then he started walking away. It was like he just wanted that guy to know that he was actually in charge. <laughs> so fascinating, because they could really hurt you, but they don't. Um, one of the guides. That's a good question, because I'm in the picture. Yeah, one of the guides took the picture. Thank you. They love using our cameras. If I take two camera bodies, I usually only get to use one, because <laughs> they'll take a whole bunch of pictures. Um, here in Botswana, we saw these lions had killed a buffalo in the water, and they wouldn't let the rest of the pride eat until they were done. Just power. You just see the power in the, in the claws or the, the talons in that. And see the one, I like the one looking on behind, taking, waiting its turn. Then after they ate, they got in the mud, everybody got dirty, and mom still loves the little one. This guy, I don't know if he's brushing his teeth or what, but he, is, he just, I thought that was really cute. And here I was looking, this is a National Geographic photographer, and I look over at this lion walking up to his car, and I thought, I wonder if he's thinking, does that seat have enough leg room or what? But because he just stood there looking in, and then all, and the guy hadn't even seen the lion at first because he was photographing the pride-eating zebra. And then uh, all of a sudden he looked over, and here's this lion looking like it's going to jump in the seat. But then the lion walked on, didn't jump in the seat. So, But um, we stay in pretty nice places. This is called a tent, permanent tented lodge. Some of them are quite nice inside. Um, whoops. Bathrooms are nice. So you're not roughing it out there. Um, they have an outdoor shower on this one, also have an indoor shower, but uh, pretty nice places. And I pick lodges where the animals are right around the lodges, or you, or you can have animals right around the lodges. And this day, this elephant blocked the guy's stairway, and he couldn't go on the game drive for about 20 minutes because he couldn't get out of his tent. <laughs> so, But they often will set up something fun for us. Here's a sundowner in... Uh, They'll put out a nice spread. They'll surprise you. You come around a corner, and you're looking for lions or elephants or whatever, and all of a sudden, here they've got this beautiful setup for you, and you just stop and enjoy it, watch the sunset. They usually do it in a beautiful place to watch the sunset from. And this group, they set out a meal for us probably 300 yards from the kitchen. They had to walk every single pot and pan and all of our plate settings, everything, all the way down on this deck just so that we could have a special night. And it was just fantastic. This is in Botswana. And in Zambia, the chefs were having a good time making pasta. So, but they're just wonderful people. Very friendly and uh, just fun. Yes, <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, our lodge in Zambia is called Camp Kakanaka. A beautiful place right on the Okavango Delta. And this one was back in Kenya. I photographed this early one morning. Mom was grazing, just standing around eating. And this little guy's running back and forth, just so excited like your dog does when, it does, when it's excited. The little rhino was doing that. And I thought, I haven't ever seen a picture of a rhino with all of his feet off the ground before. So he's not too big, but that's OK. And then hyenas. You don't see very many hyenas looking good. And I thought, this one looked good, so I let him stay in the slideshow. Lilac-breasted rollers. I always like to try to get them doing something with their mouth open or eating a bug or something. It just makes it more interesting. And this bird is an African jacana. They, um, look at the size of the feet on that guy. They, they also call lily trotters because they can walk across the tops of lily pads with those feet. They're so, the feet are so big they don't have any problem walking across lily pads. And on our way home one night in May, we came on, we saw a couple cars stopped on the right, and they were watching a leopard that was on the right. And I saw this little pond down on the left, just a puddle. So I asked the driver, I said, let's pull down on the left in front of that pond and wait and see if the leopard comes to drink. And all of a sudden, he came to drink, and the guy just held up the floodlight or spotlight from the car. And that's what I used as my light. And this is one of the ones that was at a 40th of a second. Uh, you can see the tongue movement, but the rest of it is sharp. So I was happy with that. 
I just leaned it on the back of the seat in front of me because I didn't have any time to do anything fancy. So I just took advantage of that, and I just love the picture. This baboon is watching for something. He's being very careful. He's eating the water lily bulbs, and uh, he's, but he, he would just be watching all the time. And I thought, what's he looking for? And then I realized there's a crocodile, or a, yeah, a crocodile right nearby. So he's watching for crocodiles. He doesn't want to get eaten because the crocodiles will take a baboon just as sure as anything. And these uh, red lechwe, again, the males chasing the males, out there running around. He's got a good beat on him now. He's coming fast. And this one's kind of hiding. I think he didn't want to fight. He's got smaller horns, so I think he's hiding from those other guys. It was in the same, same group. <laughs> and one time I got an opportunity to, this was in Namibia, I got to lay on the ground and photograph up at a cheetah, right over me. He's like three feet away. And they, were, they, were, they weren't really pets because they weren't tame. You couldn't pet them, but they kept them on their property and they would feed them every morning. So the guy said, do you want to you go out here with me tomorrow morning and feed the cheetahs? I said, well, do I get to take pictures? He said, yeah. I said, what did it cost, 20 bucks? I said, okay. So I get out there and he's holding a bucket with some meat in it. And the cheetahs came from way down there. They just come slowly, slowly, slowly. They finally get up to him and he holds the bucket and they start getting frustrated. They start growling at him and snarling at him. So I just laid down. I said, it's okay if I lay down here. And he goes, yeah, they won't pay any attention to you because they're watching the meat. So that's what happened. So that's why, how I got that picture because otherwise I don't know if I'd ever get a picture like that. And then I had an interesting experience this last uh, July. There's a photographer that he's made some books and he was out photographing and I saw that he had gotten to a spot where this little serval cat kitten was down in a hole or a, a gully and he went down in that, uh, he was photographing at the edge of the gully and I thought, man, I wish he'd move his car so we could all photograph. And all of a sudden he goes, Paul, you want to get into my car? And I thought, is he really a photographer? Because most photographers are so competitive, they don't want to share their spot. So I just thought, this guy's amazing. I didn't get into his car because I had a client with me. So I said, well, that wouldn't be right. So we just photographed what we could, and we got some nice pictures. And the little elephants are fun to watch them. When they get around water, they're trying to drink here. They don't know how to use a trunk to drink. So he's just putting his, water, his mouth in the water to drink. I don't know what this guy's doing. <laughs> but it was funny. He kept stabbing his horns in the mud, an impala. And the hippos just at uh, sunset. I love trying to photograph them with their mouths open when they're, they were kind of fighting with each other. And this was another nighttime photo where the guy drove us up under a tree. There was a leopard up in the tree and a leopard on the ground. The mother was on the ground. And the one in the tree was eating something and it was just snarling at its mother. I don't know what it was snarling about, but I took advantage of it. This is a nyala. And they're interesting because they do their dominance dances in slow motion. It's just weird. You think, why do they do that? They'll raise the hair on the back of their neck, and they will start moving as slowly as they can. And there might be five of them doing this. And I think, what are they doing? And the guide says, the one who can do it the longest wins. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> anyway. Um, I like the, the S-shaped curve kind of of this picture, even though the leopard's looking the other way. I still kind of enjoy that. So, I mean, just having a good day, enjoying the sunshine. And this is a European uh, bee eater. Just, I thought, just a beautiful bird. It almost looks like it's out of the movies instead of a regular wild bird. Then I got down to Namibia to the quiver trees. And we were just photographing. The reason they have their names as the quiver trees is the bushmen used to use the branches because the branches are hollow. They'd cut off a branch and they'd take out the uh, in or clean out the inside, put a cap on one end, carry their arrows in that. So they call it a quiver tree. And the birds, these are communal sparrows, build these big nests in the in the trees. They can weigh over a thousand pounds, but you might have five hundred to 1,000 or 1,500 birds in that nest. Just pretty around sunset in that. 
And then if you go to Namibia, you want to photograph the sand dunes. They have thousand foot high sand dunes. They're just spectacular. The wind was ripping along. And this is a place called Dead Vlay. About 300 years ago, it flooded and it killed all the uh, camel thorn trees in there. They died, but they stay standing now and you'll see them in a lot of uh, outdoor enthusiast photo magazines and that. You'll see pictures of this, this little area. And the day I was there, we got a lot of clouds and the guide said, I've never seen clouds like this here in Namibia because it's such a dry desert. They don't get any rain, almost none. And there were the clouds, so I thought, I gotta, I gotta photograph that. We just stopped and laid down in the road. And then in that area, the sand, uh, this is called Coleman's Cop, the town, and the sand has just moved in, covering up the old dormitories where the diamond, uh, diamond miners were living. And back in the uh, early 50s, they all moved out because they thought they'd found all the diamonds, so they moved out. And the sand has just taken over. Now, <laughs> I looked at that picture and I went, what? <laughs> but it's just a gull was flying right over the pelican, and I just love it. So sorry to put you through that. <laughs> but do you like the reflections? I like the reflection. I like the, uh, the eyes have the sun glinting in the eyes, so it just makes a nice reflection. These are called black-faced impala. They're only down in Namibia, they don't find them in other places. They, they have a black face, and so they're unique to that area. One day we were riding in a boat on this river in northern Namibia, up in the panhandle of Namibia, and we came around a corner, and here's this elephant just enjoying himself in the water. Well, he didn't enjoy us in the water, too. They don't like sharing. <laughs> and so he kind of looked like he was going to charge us, but then he backed off and went out of the water finally, because the stairs we were going to go up and over were just over to the left. And the giraffes, you always hear about giraffes fighting. This was kind of, I thought, a beautiful setting for them in uh, Lake Nakuru in Kenya. Roth, uh, reticulated Rothschild's giraffe, sorry. And I like this red, uh, redneck spur fowl, just crowing away early in the morning. They just love to make the sounds that they like to make. And another uh, uh, gray-crowned crane. They're just such beautiful birds. And then back again to the human qualities, I think that this picture is one of my best sellers also. People really like that. And the mom playing with their, the cub playing with the mom. Mom wasn't necessarily in a playing mood. But the cubs don't care. <laughs> the cubs think life's a game. They want to play all the time. Drinking early in the morning, sunlight in their eyes. And this guy was just on our last trip. I thought he was just beautiful, magnificent, big lion in Ngorongoro Crater. We first saw him first in the fog, and then when he, the fog lifted a little bit, and he came towards me, and I thought, man, he is beautiful. And this is a brown snake eagle, and you don't see very many of them. First time I've really gotten to photograph one up close enough to get a good picture. So I, I love their yellow eyes with that dark, all the dark feathers and that, just beautiful birds. And this is a giant kingfisher with a little fish he's got. Looks like an argument going on here. <laughs> okay, let's shake and make up. <laughs> just, the, the baboons are just like people. They're so funny. I just laugh when I get around baboons. And this is a uh, red and yellow barbet. And they eat termites. And so he's on a termite mound. And just was posing, I liked the background, I liked, uh, I liked a lot about this picture, so that's why I've got it here for you today. Just beautiful birds. And this little girl was just, she loved somebody taking her picture. She was just smiling and she would do all kinds of things to make faces at me while I was trying to photograph her. But she was so cute, I just wanted just a simple picture. You can tell it's a girl because these little uh, braids on her head go forwards. This is in Namibia, the Himba people. And the boys have the braids going backwards. So an interesting way to tell the difference. And this lady was just watching somebody. She had just brought water to the, to the uh, they carry water in a five-gallon bucket up on her head. And she just brought water, and then she picked up her baby. And I just thought I liked the way she was standing there at the entrance to the corral. 
and sometimes you get a chance to photograph the guys out fishing or making their way home from fishing at night. But then I've got elephants I love to also show not just a close-up, but I like showing them in their element so that they, uh, you can see where they live. And this guy was not charging us. He had been doing mock charges. He did three mock charges at us, but then he, he said, well, they're not going to hurt me. So he just started blowing dust on himself, and I waited for his ears to go out. So it was kind of cool. Anyway, uh, we get uh, the Maasai, or no, in the Samburu area in Kenya, and I just love the old trees, this elephant down there in his element again, in the Uwaso Nyiro River. In, in Zambia, we were driving along at night, on a night game drive, and all of a sudden the guard, the driver stopped the car, and the guy shined his light, and here's this little thing like a mouse over there. And he said, it's actually an elephant shrew. And if you look, you can see the long nose on this guy. It's a little different than a mouse. His feet are different. And it was just really cute. And he kept jumping around. It was hard to photograph him because he kept moving so fast. But he finally stopped long enough for me to get a picture. And again, that was at a 40th of a second. with Because uh, at night, ISO was 2,000. And I don't like to go higher than that because you get so much noise. So I try not to. And then on this last trip, we had a just a fantastic experience watching this leopard. We had seen him up in a tree, came down out of the tree, came down here to drink, but just up right over the top of his tail was a hippo in the water that didn't want the leopard drinking there. So he kept showing his teeth to this leopard, and the leopard didn't seem to pay any attention, just drank as much as he wanted to drink, and then moved on. So it's just fascinating to see a hippo challenging a leopard. And here I just kind of like the zebra looking back, these little ox peckers on him. They, they're the birds that pick out the bugs and stuff on the zebras, so, or on a lot of the animals. Now we get to the Great Migration in Kenya. <clears throat> and uh, it's just one of the most amazing things to see. And I, I've always tried to get the animals running towards me. And this one day, they all were going to the river and running away the other way. And so I said, man, is there any way we can get them running towards us. He goes, just wait a minute. They're going to come back. I said, why will they come back? He said, there's no place to cross. It's too steep, too far down. Sure enough, about a minute and a half, all of a sudden, the whole herd comes stampeding towards us. So I was able to get them running. They just ran around the vehicle and everything. They don't run into you. They just don't pay attention to you. But I like, again, light and dust. The zebras are uh, wildebeest going down into the dry riverbed here. They're just crossing the dry riverbed. But I thought it was so fascinating with all the dust and the and, uh, all the animals standing around waiting to jump down in. When they get to the Mara River, they won't cross until one of them jumps in. And then, and, and they don't have a leader, that's what, so sometimes you can wait for hours. <laughs> and so finally one will jump and then they'll all start crossing. And when they start jumping, it's just amazing. They'll jump over anything, into anything. It's like frenzy, they don't care. And the zebra's coming across. And this is one of my, well, I, I call this one of my best pictures because the wildebeest got away. And he just stuck his horn into the roof of that crocodile's mouth, and it must have hurt enough that the croc opened up really wide, let go, and the uh, uh, wildebeest got away. It was just an amazing day. It was a great day for that wildebeest. And then I got an opportunity to go up on an early morning hot air balloon ride in the Serengeti. And we're looking down, looking down at some zebra, a few more zebra, all the way to the horizon there. And then the wildebeest, just amazing when you're up there from, you know, I'm up probably three or 400 feet. And you see all the way to the horizon, all the little dots are wildebeest. And then there's the reason they're down in the southern end of the Serengeti. She's having her baby. In five minutes, it's standing. And there's good reason for that, because here comes a lion after the mother. Didn't get this one, because I just thought, oh man, the lion's going to get it. It's so close, all of a sudden, boom, the wildebeest got a hard right turn, and the lion ran right on by. The cats can't turn as quickly as some of the antelope. So it's just, uh, it's, it's fascinating to watch uh, when they're hunting. I like watching the hunt. I don't like watching them kill something. I've seen it a few times, but I'd rather just watch the hunt and see how they set it all up. 
Um, I want to go back to this picture because we used to get beautiful sunrises and sunsets almost every day. And now, probably half the time, you get cloudy. And it's disappointing, but that's what's, something's changing out there. <clears throat> this is a sunbird. Um, beautiful little birds, and they sit around and they climb all over these flowers or different flowers where they suck the nectar out. They're about a little bit bigger than a hummingbird. So they're not very big, but they're just fascinating, beautifully colored birds. Bee eater eating something a little bigger, got a dragonfly. But I like the background, being out of focus like that. that that's why I like, like this picture. This almost looks like a black and white picture. It's not, but I was in Namibia and I just saw this whole scene and I thought, man, look at all the different animals right there. That's just amazing, and the size of those elephants. Um, I was, when we were in uh, Zambia this last time, there was a migration of these cri uh, crimson, what is it, crimson bee eaters, crimson, uh, yeah, crimson bee eaters. It doesn't sound quite right, something like crimson, but they're beautiful and they would just be flocking and you'd see hundreds of them. And all of a sudden one would fly up in the air, grab something out of the air, come back, start banging it on the branch. Because if it's a bee, they want to kill it, take the stinger out before they eat it so they don't get stung. It was just fascinating. And then animals, this guy's jumping over a, 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 an Egyptian goose. Scared the goose, but he made it. <laughs> and the dust and, the, and the, uh, just the light on this elephant. It was just beautiful. I just thought that's a different perspective. I like to do that once in a while. I like to try to change it up. Leopard hanging in the tree. And then the leopard's down on the ground. And it had caught something earlier in the day, and it was dragging it up, up a tree now. So it took it up a tree. Just amazing to see the power of these animals just drag something right up the tree that weighs almost as much as they do. And so in Zambia this last time, I like seeing the man in the boat, but you see the hippo just up on the right. That big thing that looks like a rock, it's a hippo, not far from him. So he had to be kind of careful because the hippos have been known to charge people in boats or... Uh, along the rivers there. The hippos, they say, kill more people in Africa than any other animal. And then a zebra just putting his head up on the other one, looking at me. Elephant chasing the impala away from the river because they don't like to share their water. It's a huge river, the Chobe River in Botswana. They don't like sharing their water with anything. So they're chasing those impala away. Mom checking on the baby elephant, making sure she's okay. I like the texture of the animals. And I show you this just to show you how big these elephants are. And this is a big nine passenger vehicle uh, with a roof on top. And look at how it is compared to that elephant. The elephant was just going along the side of the road so they weren't in any danger. But here one morning I got to photograph a lioness carrying her little cub. And that's so rare because I've only seen that one time. And I was lucky enough to get a picture. This guy was about four feet out of my window. I had to take off the telephoto and put on my wide angle lens to get a picture. He was standing there on the road in Ngorongoro Crater. That's just an amazing place to see wildlife. And this guy was posing on a rock in the uh, Masai Mara. It was stormy skies, thunder and lightning all around. And the wind was blowing about 20 miles an hour. It looks like he's in the studio. And then there wasn't enough light and all of a sudden the light filtered through a hole in the clouds i got the picture and then it started to rain and in a minute it was pouring rain so i had lucky timing these are go away birds bare-faced go away birds they like to warn the other animals when people are nearby or something they kind of make a sound like go away go away <laughs> and so they call them go away bird makes sense <laughs> Lilac breasted roller, just taking off. They're just beautiful birds. And uh, I didn't used to be into birds as much as I've gotten into birds. I like birds a lot now. I used to just be into the larger animals. Little, little baby just learning how to use his trunk. And this is a picture that I changed the background on. Or a friend of mine helped me change the background because there, I took it after the sun had gone down and the leopard was in a tree right over me about 10 feet away. 
and I was getting worried we were too close. I couldn't even zoom out to get both paws in the picture. And so I thought, well, I'll just take the picture, but there was branches and a white sky. And a friend of mine said, Paul, do you have a night sky? I said, yeah, I do. So he changed it for me. And I like it a lot better that way. But that, that was probably the most Photoshop I've done to one of my pictures. But uh, just getting a nice sharp picture of the lion's eye. I always focus on their eyes. And this I just got on my last trip was a picture I thought I would never ever get. So I was thrilled to get it. She came, she, she had been sitting or raising this cub in a rock pile where there was a cave down underneath. And all of a sudden this one morning that we got there, Pride of Lions came and sat down about 50 yards away and were just resting. And she saw the lion, she came sneaking around the other side, down into the uh, rock pile, got the baby, came out, and she came all the way across the river, straight towards us, up, just kept coming straight at us. I couldn't believe it. And I got the picture, and uh, then she went, she laid down under, under some bushes, and we couldn't see them anymore. So we left, and it was just, I don't like to bother the animals, so, but I like to take advantage of what they offer. Sometimes they just look like they want to play with us. And this was interesting because a pride of lions had been eating this buffalo, and the buffalo was laying right in the road. So we just parked right at the end of the buffalo, and all the, we saw it the day before, and all the, animal, all the lions looked starved. And we came back the next day, and they're all full. Went, wow, they must have ate a lot. Well, then all the cubs were laying down sleeping, and, the, and then all of a sudden mom started to eat at, up at this end of the buffalo, and the cubs started waking up, and she just roared at them to stay away. She wanted her alone time. And um, it was just fascinating to watch. When, when she roared, it shook everything around. The whole car just shook, and just an incredible sound. And here I was in uh, South Africa last year, and uh, I was on my way to breakfast, and I saw this giraffe standing out there, and I went, oh, I think I can make a picture out of that. I went back and grabbed my camera and came back, and I just love the way he's looking in the window now uh, through the doorway. Just beautiful, I thought. And this was a picture where I was watching this leopard walk up the road. It laid down to groom itself right next to me. Then it walked down to the other side of this little pond, and the driver started to follow him, and I said, no, let's go back up on the road so we can look straight at him. And I'm looking straight at him, and he's drinking and drinking and drinking, and he's not looking up. So finally I thought, what can I do to make him look up? I don't want to annoy a leopard that's only 30 feet away. And so I put my camera into high speed, and I held the shutter down for like a second and a half. It shot off 15 pictures, and then I waited till he looked up, and then I took another picture. And fortunately, his tongue was in the water. And at first I thought, oh, man, I don't like those weeds. But then on closer look, they're all four-leaf clovers. So I thought, okay, we can live with that. And I like eye contact. This little guy. The little cubs are so cute. You can watch them for hours. And there we go. We found the picture we're looking for. So, <laughs> well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions, or is now a good time for questions? Yeah, that was a good, great time for questions. So uh, we'll make sure... We pass the mic so everybody can both hear the question, and we're, we've been video recording all of this, so that's why we want to have you use the mic so that the question gets on the video as well as Paul's answer. I'm very curious. Other than the crocodiles, we saw no reptiles, no monitor lizards, none of the rock lizards, uh, no snakes at all. I've been to Tanzania once. We had like five different varieties of snakes plus mm -hmm. lizards. Is that by your choice? I know you've seen them. Oh yeah, I've seen them. It's by my choice because a lot of people don't like to see them. Okay. I I've, was I've learned by doing, I've done a lot of talks and I've learned that a lot of people don't like the animals killing animals and they don't like snakes and things like that. And I, I'm curious, when you're shooting telephoto, what's your aperture of choice assuming you've got good light? Well, if I've got good light, it depends on how far away they are, but usually 7.1 or f8 for my long lens, and uh, that works out pretty well. 
Let me just ask the man in the back. Could you hear his question? Because he was pretty loud. I thought I didn't need to repeat. Yeah, I was going to mention, Truman, yes. next time we give you the microphone, could you speak up a little? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else have questions? I just wonder how many uh, images you have. I mean, throwaway images you have must have thousands. I do. And I know a club that would probably really like to look at them. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I know you get tired of looking at them, I would. <laughs> Bert, you do but, a lot of burst shooting uh, with, with what you're doing? Not a lot. I do, if I do burst shooting, it's in the slower burst speed because I've found that my pictures in, in the high burst mode are not as sharp <clears throat> as in lower burst mode. And that might be operator error, I don't know. But uh, yeah, that's just what I found. What method of focus do you use? Back button focus? No, I, I did back button focus for a while, but I, I didn't see how it really helped me a lot, personally. Mm -hmm. So I just went back to the regular focus, and I just used that. Do you focus and recompose? No. I move my focus you points. You move the focus point. I predict where I want the eyes in the animal to be when I take the picture, and that's where I put my focus point. I wait for them to get there. Sometimes right. it works, sometimes it doesn't. All right. Thank you. Uh -huh. I'd like to know in a typical shooting day, I'm in the booth. I'd like to know in the typical shooting day how you um, how much time you spend uh, just sitting and waiting for a shot. Like, well, I'm a little bit different than the guys who just sit and wait because if you're doing that, you're missing everything else. And out there, the way I run my trips, I've got six. Let's say we're in Tanzania and Kenya. I've got six vehicles with six driver guides out looking for wildlife, and they're all in touch by radio. Somebody's always seeing something. If you're watching lions laying there sleeping you, and you stay there, that's fine. That's, you can do that. But you're going to miss what the other people are seeing. And so I've found that I just take advantage of what nature offers me. That's what I photograph. And fortunately, I get to go often enough that I get to see a lot. I've just been overwhelmed with what I've seen at times, you know. So we were just in Botswana, and we had 250 elephants crossing the Chobe River, swimming across the river right in front of us. And who gets to see that? It was just amazing. So I, I just love the experience as I get out there. Yes? I have a question about your vertical cropping on your, on your shots. Mm -hmm. Is that a standard crop or narrower than usual? It, Pretty close to standard. I, sometimes I just do it in camera raw and that doesn't have the settings. I just do it to what looks like the standard crop. Sometimes they're a little bit narrower. You cut out what you don't want. Yes. Yeah. I shoot for myself. I never submitted a picture to a magazine or anything like that. I'm not a famous photographer. I just shoot for myself. I make myself happy. And that's what I like. You know, that's what we live for. It's been about 30 years since I've been to Kenya, but I was so taken by the uh, warthogs. And I see you didn't, some of the male ones were so amazing sitting in the grass with their. Well, Jim told I me. Didn't I didn't see many of those. Do you see them though still? Jim told me I had too many pictures. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, no, I do. A lot of people love warthogs, and they're great, and I've got some great pictures, but I just. Most people don't care about warthogs, but a lot of people really like them, so I've got to include more warthogs. Yes. I came back from Paul's trip with 6,500 photos. <laughs> um, that was on the short end. There was one member in the, in the trip who came back with 17,000 really? photos. Yeah. <laughs> Larry from the East Larry Coast. Did? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. But he would use burst mode and just hold it down until something happened. Right. <laughs> so... He had a lot of pictures to go through, yeah. I remember one night I saw him just shooting from the hip because the, the sun had set, it was dark, and these eland were leaping. And he just, and I thought, what did he do that for? And then he showed me one picture he got, and it was amazing of this eland way up in the air, and eland are the largest antelope. And so it was an amazing photograph, movement and everything, because it was so dark. But, so I, I try not to laugh at what other people are doing. <laughs> How about uh, insects? Uh, well, insects that annoy you and insects that are beautiful, like uh, do they have butterflies there? They do, sometimes, yeah. 
I go in the dry seasons, and so you don't see as many insects. In fact, you don't, like people always go, how about all the bugs? We don't see them. Because if you go there in the rainy seasons, you get a lot of bugs, a lot of insects. But in the dry season, very few. Once in a while, you'll see some really interesting ones, or big spiders, or things like that. Oh, I was going to ask about spiders. Yeah. I've seen bigger ones in South America, or in uh, Costa Rica. During the rainy season, are they the type of insects that invade you, like the mosquitoes and flies, or? Uh... I would say yes, there are more. I remember that from when I was young, growing up there. But now on the trips, we hardly see any mosquitoes. Hardly, hardly any. If you see five or 10 mosquitoes, that's a lot. So we don't worry too much about them. I, I take insect repellent with me on every trip, but I only use it very rarely, I don't know. Uh, very rarely. Yes? Talk a little bit more about what the uh, safari is like, how long it is and, and how many days and okay. so on. A little bit more information about that. Usually they're ab about two weeks on the ground, give or take a day. Um, because I still like longer trips. Most people now, most, most safari operators have cut them down to 10-day trips because they want to um, cut the cost keep the prices down under $10,000, but we include the airfare, so when you add on the airfare, their prices are almost the same as ours, but you get four more days on our trips. So uh, we feel it's a very good value. We stay in really nice lodges, and I just want to give people the best experience they can get, because that's what I want for myself, too. Every trip I go on, I think, now what can be the best thing that we can do that we can see, and that's where I take people, and that's what we do, and it's worked, because all my trips for next year were sold out, so um, I'm looking at 2020 now, and I don't have the prices even. I, got, I do five trips a year. I take uh, 18 people to Tanzania and Kenya, and 12 people to Southern Africa. So that's a lot of people every year to take on safari, and I meet them, believe it or not, this is, it's crazy almost, because I think, I show my photos in art, art shows, and People see me in an art show, we talk a little bit about the safari. I ask them if they want to join my newsletter. And speaking of newsletters, if anybody would like to receive my newsletter, after I come back from a trip, I send out pictures of what we saw. And I don't pressure anybody to do anything about buying a trip or something. That's just for your enjoyment. And then, um, uh, but I people meet people at these art shows, and maybe a year or two later, they've been getting my newsletter, and then they sign up and go on safari. And it's a fascinating way to make a living. It means I have to work all the time. When I'm not in Africa, I'm doing art shows. And so, uh, but it's something I love doing. And yeah. you know, how many people get to do this? So I'm very fortunate, love doing it, love sharing it with people too, because that's part of my job on the trip is I rotate through the vehicles, help people with their photography if they need it, or I can learn a lot like I can from Jim when I'm on in his vehicle. <laughs> He's showing me all about his Lumix camera. And that was fantastic. So it's, uh, you know, a lot of times I have people who know a lot more than I do about photography. I, I do it very simply, I think, because I used to wonder, well, how come people think photography is hard? Because I do it so simply. I shoot an aperture priority, and I just have learned, look at the shutter speed in the ISO, make sure everything's okay, and then you can, you're good to shoot. So it seems to work easily for me, and I don't, maybe I should use the uh, TV button once in a while and set the, set the shutter speed, but I just don't, just don't get around to doing that. If I start changing buttons, I'll forget I changed them, and then I'll mess up a bunch of pictures. So I just keep it simple. And I've got some pictures up here that you can come and look at and see what, uh, what, you know, what I get. I have a fellow named Craig Coppola who prints them for me. He actually, I, I learned about him a little over a year ago. He has his whole garage at home set up. <laughs> He's a stay-at-home dad, takes care of his kids but he prints pictures all the time. He's got one guy who works for him, and they, like if I call him and say, Craig, I need a print of that by tomorrow. Okay, no problem, I'll have it ready this afternoon. And it's just amazing, and I, it's 20 minutes away, so I run down and pick it up. So I'm very fortunate that way. And his prices are very reasonable. So, um, and look at the quality of his work. Does he mount them for you? Yes, well, yeah, he, he mounts them, and he puts them on, let me not show you that one, because that's a weird one. I used to get that somewhere else picture say Oops. here's a metal frame that he puts in the back to hang it 
two screws in the wall for their level, then you can slide this back and forth as long as the screws are inside the frame. It's about the simplest hanging procedure I've ever seen. And uh, it works very well. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you, Paul. That was terrific.